Community, the now classic sitcom created for NBC by Dan Harmon in 2009, has a lot of great episodes. But it also has a few, well, worse ones. Ask a fan to list them, and you'll hear more than a few answers. Maybe Basic Sandwich, maybe The Art of Discourse, probably the Inspecticon episode, Heroic Origins, Economics of Marine Biology… it'll depend on who you ask. But no matter who you pick, no matter how many times you ask, one episode's gonna come up again and again. Season 4, Episode 9, Intro to Felt Surrogacy, the puppet episode. Maybe there are more forgettable episodes, or lower individual points, but fan consensus does tend to place this one at the very bottom of the barrel, and it's not hard to see why. It's a big swing, and a big miss. By this point, Community had built up a storied tradition of showstopper, genre-bending homage episodes, which had become beloved by fans, and the puppet episode is very consciously trying to insert itself into this canon, and it just does not succeed. Intro to Felt Surrogacy aimed for the stars and fell flat on its face. The gulf between ambition and result here is unmatched. Today's video, then, is an autopsy. How and why does this episode fail? Let's find out. Spoilers ahead for various episodes. In case you've forgotten, this is the episode that opens with the Dean accosting a depressed study group, a group that don't want to talk about their silence, and has him suggest puppet therapy as a reinvigoration tool. I understand. You don't want to talk about it. And you won't have to. They will talk for you! The gang begrudgingly gets on board, and the episode's presentation shifts from live-action folks with their hands in socks to more sophisticated puppetry. We are shown what the real group are acting out via their felt proxies, and that is a scene from last Friday, in which the group realise they've got into a bit of a rut. Okay, stop! Square! How did we get so predictable? I mean, hey, they're not wrong there, but this isn't gas leak year self-flagellation. That doesn't start until next year. No, they're just down. And upon resolving to fix this with an adventure, they burst into song. Where? Where would we go? We can go anywhere that you know. Across the course of a rather jaunty number, they decide to go on a balloon ride, but take off without the balloon guide, and as a result, they crash land in a forest. There, they're met by an odd woodsman, who sings at them and feeds them berries that make you trip. I really love these berries, where are they from? Afterward, the gang's coming down, but still feeling uninhibited, so Shirley decides to tell them all a shameful secret. A while back, she mistakenly thought she saw her husband with another woman, then followed them out of town, and in doing so, left her kids in a shop all night. Back in the present day, she's mortified, but the rest of the group hadn't even remembered she'd said anything. They realised they'd all reveal deep, dark secrets, they'd all forgotten each other's, and they'd all assumed, ever since, that group morale was down because everyone else had remembered their secret shame. So to make Shirley feel better, they all decide to clear the air in a final, confessional musical number. Jeff skipped out on being involved with a girlfriend's kid, Britta's never voted, Troy started a fire ten years ago, Pierce never actually managed to seal the deal with Eartha Kitt, Annie let her history professor get some Tarantino action in return for a good grade, and Arbed, well, Arbed didn't say anything. He was just mimicking the group's depression to fit in. Back in the present, we de-puppet, everyone's happy and smiley again, Britta gets dunked on, and the Dean fantasises about Jeff. That is to say, things are back to normal. So that's what happens. Now it's time to tear it open and dig around. Before the negativity begins, though, it is probably worth pointing out the obvious. This isn't all bad. For one, the music slaps, particularly that opening song, and that shouldn't really be a surprise. Names as big as Sarah Bareilles, who even pops up in the episode, and Maroon 5's Adam Levine had writing input on these tracks, along with show composer Ludwig Göransson, of course, whose musical mastery is familiar to anyone who's seen Black Panther, or The Mandalorian, or Oppenheimer, or listened to Childish Gambino. But yeah, any community fan, even the most rabid critic of this fourth season, will probably come to bat for this episode's musicality. The production design is similarly impressive. Can we just take a minute to appreciate how good these puppets look? How brilliantly, how lovably they caricature our cast? 
And that's to say nothing of the puppeteers themselves. Yvette Nicole Brown, in the DVD commentary track for this episode, which I'll make reference to a few times in this video, speaks about the amount of work and the amount of talent that went into pulling off the whole community but puppets effect. Each of the Greendale Seven had their own puppeteer, who had the task of capturing each real cast member's physical and verbal mannerisms to suit the voice dub as cleanly as possible, and they did a tremendous job. It's one of those things you only notice if it's done badly, and here it's seamless. That dub, too, is very solid. Community's cast has always been top tier, and so the chemistry here, the line reads, are as good as ever. I did see Blue Man Group, I just didn't get it! Why can't they talk? They have so much in common! So many parts of this episode, taken in isolation, are this successful. So that's the good. The bad is… well, everything else. Wait, no, that's not really fair. If the good is in those discrete pieces, the lines, designs, elements of performance you see by zooming right in, the bad is the picture that emerges when you zoom back out. Well, actually, it is some of those pieces too. The songs, they have a great sound, they have great melodies, they're generally sung well, but the lyrics can and do drop the ball on quality. Yes, the cast is good, especially when they're all together, but for a lot of this one, they're not. Pierce is curiously absent in the live-action segments, allegedly because of all that behind-the-scenes Chevy Chase friction. You can't really blame the show for Chase being a dick, sure, but it does make those curiously flat framing sequences, more on that soon, feel all the emptier. So, yeah, there are these, and there are more individual moments of weakness which we will get to, but none of this is what makes Felt Surrogacy the worst episode. What is? Well, if you'll permit me a brief tangent, one Christmas gift I'm still working my way through is the book Homer and His Iliad by Robin Lane Fox. Square. Square. Nah, nah, put your pillar of garbage bingo cards down, I'm going somewhere with this. In a discussion of what differentiates the plotting of Homeric epic poetry from other heroic poetry of the time, Lane Fox draws on a distinction made by the obscure ancient Greek writer Polyanos, arguing that Homer's poems are structured, they show sustained thematic focus, and have plots with clear beginnings, middles, and ends. Ends. Other superficially similar attempts at long heroic poetry often tend to differ here, to be, quote, made up of a succession of episodes set loosely after one another. They're the narrative equivalent of a run-on sentence. Thinking back to Homeric epic, true epic for Lane Fox, these poems may contain countless other nuggets within, but really, the Iliad is one story about Achilles' rage, and the Odyssey is one story about Odysseus's wayward homecoming. By contrast, there was no real sense of unity to those inferior poems, structural or thematic. Translating Polyanus's complaint, Lane Fox describes them as and-then poems, telling stories which don't feel focused or purposeful, which just show a bunch of semi-related fun things happening, this, and then this, and then this, and so on. Intro to Felt Surrogacy is an and-then episode. Now, far be it from me to liken a network sitcom to arguably the high watermark for Western literature altogether, but I think the distinction Lane Fox makes here is useful to our discussion of Community's worst episode, because at their best, Community's higher concept homage episodes, animated or no, have a similar sense of unity, one that's very absent in felt surrogacy. Abed's Uncontrollable Christmas is claymation. It's a homage to projects like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and that's in order to tell a story specifically about media, family, and bonding, about the transportive power of the thing the presentation pays homage to. For more details on what I'm talking about here, I'd recommend this recent video of mine all about this episode, but for now, suffice it to say that while Arbed's Uncontrollable Christmas has plenty of fun with that format along the way, that fun follows the focus. And that's the rule for episodes like these. The point isn't simply let's have fun with a different style, it's not simply reference, parody, or pastiche. We do get these things, but it's never pastiche for pastiche's sake. Yes, the inherent fun of the wackiness, the genre-bending of episodes like that, or contemporary American poultry, or G.I. Jeff is a point, but it's never the point. The point is let's explore Jeff losing his role as group leader, what that'd do 
do to him, what that'd do to the others, and we can do that by writing that story via a mafia movie template, the rise and fall genre. Let's have fun with the inherent excess and absurdity of good fellas in the canteen, but let's never lose sight of that focused character basis, let's keep it firmly in sight throughout. Or the point is, we're five seasons into an adult goes back to school premise, Jeff is kinda old now and he's still getting older, let's explore an adult's fantasy of youth through the format of other adults' fantasies for youths, and through that, pull out the whole grass is greener truth of aging. Kids don't want to be adults, they want to inhabit their fantasy of adulthood and vice versa. And again, let's seed this idea all throughout the episode, let's have the driving force of this story be those strange disconnects between how Jeff assumes this fantasy works and the very blinkered way it actually does. So the way Community's more out there episodes work, when they do work, is broadly consistent. To be honest, this pattern's even true of the show's weaker gimmick episodes. Puppet episodes Season Mate, Basic Human Anatomy, not an all-timer but a relatively solid effort, especially for the gas leak year, grounds its gimmick in a very emotionally serious place, and especially on rewatch, that grounding is always clear. As we discussed in another video a while back, even the Arbed TV segments of the Season 4 premiere are purposeful, in a way the felt balloon berry trip episode simply is not. There is an attempt to ground the gimmick in story, character, orienting the climax around these tools overcoming characters' secret shame trauma, but that grounding only comes into play intermittently. It matters for the opening scene, then kind of for the climax and that ending song, but not at all for most of the episode. And there's no B story or anything to let this patchiness even partially off the hook, a la History 101. The puppets don't even end up having anything to do with the final breaking down of the group's walls, their empathy for Shirley does that. The result is a thin and unfulfilling bond between the episode's presentation and its themes. Study group falling out over secrets was well-worn ground for Community at this point, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have still worked. Take the episode Cooperative Polygraphy from the following season. For one, that episode's secrets feel in character, play off established character traits and histories in a way this one's don't always. I let Cornwallis rub my feet to give me all the answers to a test. But there's also the fact that group's trust and mood change the whole way through, much like they did in Paradigms of Human Memory or Cooperative Calligraphy. And also like those, that fluctuation matters. The pen hunt is a fluid battle to protect that trust, as is Paradigms' deployment of flashbacks. Progress is made, then lost. There's a momentum. There's no momentum in felt surrogacy. I understand that narratively the puppets are to help express what our characters can't, but that understanding never translated into real satisfaction, because that grounding only comes back in at the end. The rest of the episode just holds onto that secrets idea as a framing device for the puppet fun, and the resulting episode is just flat. There's no fluctuation, no progress toward the therapy puppet's purported purpose for much of the runtime. There's only progress toward their actual purpose. To facilitate a community episode that does uh, the Muppets. We learn in the DVD commentary that this was the idea, that the gimmick, the hey, we should do a puppet kind of episode, came first, and that justifying grounding came a good while later. Pat Keelan actually was the, he planted the seed for this idea uh, when we were doing oh, the in right. inception, inception idea of going into an animated world. He wanted to clarify, he's like, do you mean puppets? Do you want, what kind of thing? And th that kind of sparked. And hey, that's not necessarily a problem in itself, I'm sure some of the show's other out there episodes were built backwards from their gimmicks, but unlike those, the puppet episode idea never got punched up into something more. As a review on Hollywood.com put it 11 years ago, the Dean's desire to play with a box of puppets in the opening scene is a strikingly thin veil for the writer's desire to play with a box of puppets. And why does the group decide to go on an adventure? And then why a balloon? And then why a forest? Don't give yourself a headache trying to overthink this, trying to tie these into that shaky secrets therapy grounding device. The answer's a simple one. It's because puppets aren't much fun in a study room.
Here, the focus follows the fun. The story serves the gimmick, not vice versa. Why do we and then our way through psychotropic woodland berries and an unhinged wigged up Art Vandalay? Why does the plot take a route so odd here that even Yvette Nicole Brown is left audibly confused in the DVD commentary? So did he try to get them high? He did it on purpose. He knew exactly what he was doing. He that crafty bastard. It's purely to drag us to that shameful admission scene, which again, we need to justify the puppet format. It says a lot, I think, that random berry tripping is the thing facilitating this. That gimmick grounding setup is so contorted a story beat that the episode needs to drug them out of their right minds for it to happen. And this isn't the only time the plot's jackknifing disorientates. If this episode is a Frankenstein's monster, other visible seams include these lines here. We need to go big. We need an adventure. Could we ride a hot air yeah. Both of these developments are presented as natural, almost obvious suggestions, and they're accepted as such by the group in a way that's just obviously odd, and which sticks out as such despite the best efforts of a banger song to sweep you cleanly past disbelief. The plot lurches from traumatized study room into musical puppet adventure before swerving back into a confessional. And again, half of the confessions themselves feel like placeholders. Jeff's and Pierce's feel appropriate, Britta's at a stretch, but Annie's does not. Her admission and the way the group takes it are just so at odds with her past and future characterization. Honestly, watch the very next episode after this and tell me this is the same character. Troy's comes straight out of nowhere and Shirley? Yeah, she has understandable trust issues with Andre, but leaving what's-his-name and however many children she has now in a shop all night because of them just feels downright incompatible with the Shirley we'd come to know over the past three years. Therapy puppets is, I suppose, a fine concept, but from the disjointed way the therapy side of that fits into the puppet side, the best puppet bits have nothing to do with the secrets trauma, and the trauma section is the part which gets the least out of the puppet medium, and from the whiplash plotting that ties these two sides together and fills out the confessional, it's clear the minds behind this episode didn't have the vision or ability to turn Community Does the Muppets from a cool idea into a satisfying episode. The end result is an and-then story. Things happen, then other things happen in a way that's superficially cool, but that doesn't flow from any real focus or purpose, and doesn't allow the episode to say anything more about its themes or its medium. It's gimmick for gimmick's sake. It is, for my money, Community's worst episode, and that's why. So that's the end of the autopsy, but I'd like to leave you with one last thought. Yvette Nicole Brown loves this episode. She says so in the commentary. This is- um, You cut my fart cutting. <laughs> yeah. This is my favorite episode of Community, and it says a lot because Malcolm Jamal Warner has been on the show. <laughs> but my love for Henson and Muppets and Puppets is maybe a little bit stronger than my Malcolm love. I don't think this is a very good episode of Community. I've just told you why. I'm sure a lot of you agree with me, but I'm just as sure that some of you don't. That where I see a mess, some of you see enough goofy fun or killer songs to make up for it. Maybe parts of this are a lot more resonant if you're into the Muppets or musical theater. I don't know. As a fanbase, we don't like this episode, but Yvette Nicole Brown does, and perhaps that should be a reminder to us all that what we value and what we don't in an episode like this is ultimately subjective. That isn't to say these things are arbitrary, just that they're not absolute, and that they may well change over time. I've referred to this video as an autopsy a couple of times throughout, but even an autopsy isn't a fixed process. The way a researcher performs one in London is going to be different to the way an ME performs one in New York. The way that researcher does it now is going to differ from the way they would have, say, 20 years ago. So if, despite the points made in this video, if despite the scores of tweets or Reddit posts that presumably exist expressing similar sentiments, you still think this episode is good, if you have your own reasons why, which matter more to you than the things I've discussed, great. More power to you. If you enjoyed this video, maybe give it a like, share it about, and hey, I'm gonna wrap up my Streets Ahead video series real soon, so stay tuned for that. If you want to check out that DVD commentary track I mentioned, there's an online upload of it I've linked in the description, and huge thank you as always to my supporters on Patreon and YouTube, who make these videos possible. Above all, Hanan, Daniel Goldhorn, Karen Kuhlman, Magath, Brian Emily, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy. Bye now.